Good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Gross, CEO of American Friends of Tel Aviv University. I'm pleased to welcome you to today's panel discussion, Judicial Reform in Israel, featuring three professors from Tel Aviv University who are experts in their respective fields, political science, economics, and law. As evidenced by the nine weeks of protest, both within and outside of Israel, it is clear that the proposed judicial reforms are polarizing. Many academics, scholars, and citizens of Israel agree that there is a need for reform, but in an evolutionary, not a revolutionary manner. To quote Tel Aviv University President Ariel Parat, any change in Israel's fundamental constitutional regime, as has been proposed, needs to be undertaken gradually. Even though those who support change must learn that its consequences may be unexpected and undesirable. As the American fundraising arm of Tel Aviv University, it is our mission to raise awareness and needed funds for the cutting edge research that happens at Israel's largest university. Tel Aviv University is a Zionist and pluralistic pillar of academic freedom and democracy. It is a generative place where solutions to world problems are created. When you support the university, you are helping to further innovation, research and work that will change lives and make the world a better place. We hope that today's discussion will provide a better understanding of what is happening in Israel and what the proposed reforms mean for the country. Our panelists are accomplished experts in their respective fields. To save time and let you hear directly from them, I will briefly introduce each of them. Professor Uriel Abulov is an associate professor of political science at Tel Aviv University and studies the politics of fear, happiness, and hope. Professor Itai Atar is a professor of business economics at the Kahler School of Management and a senior fellow at the Israeli Democracy Institute. Professor Atar led the initiative of 380 economists, 60 former government officials, and several economics Nobel laureates who signed an open letter expressing their deep concerns about unprecedented damage to the Israeli economy from the proposed legal changes. Professor Yishai Blank is the Dean of Tel Aviv University's Bookman Faculty of Law. His research and teaching areas include local government law, administrative law, global cities, urban legal policy, law and secularism, and legal theory. He is a Tau alum, having obtained both an LLM and a BA in philosophy, both magna cum laude, from Tau. He clerked for the Chief Justice of the Israeli Supreme Court and practiced law at a top law firm in Israel. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please write them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will do our best to get to as many as possible. And now let's jump right in with our first question. Question for the panelists, please explain the issues involved in the current situation in Israel with regard to judicial reforms and why this topic is on the table at all. Let's, uh, let's start with Yishai. Can you please frame the situation we find ourselves in and explain why there's a call for change? Well, first of all, thank you for gathering this important webinar and I'm really pleased uh, to be talking to friends uh, of, uh, of Tao. Uh, on this really crucial issue that has been really polarizing uh, and tearing Israeli society apart. Um, and I'm trying not to be dramatic, but this is how it is. Um, so I think that for many decades, um, there has been a growing dissatisfaction among uh, many Israelis, uh, both within academia, in the political realm, in the legal sphere, um, from various developments that took place in the legal sphere. Uh, predominantly, the rise of what uh, has been coined the Constitutional Revolution, uh, in which two basic laws, which are fundamental laws in Israel, uh, one of them called basic law human dignity, the other one basic law uh, freedom of employment, um, have been elevated to the degree where parliamentary uh, legislation could be uh, disqualified um, by the Supreme Court based on the infringement of basic values <laughs> such as dignity or freedom of occupation, freedom of property, et cetera. Um, the court has taken this um, authority um, to disqualify, to uh, rule out, um, quash uh, legislation by the parliament um, by what has been seen by many, um, a very simple reading of the text, 
but by others who thought, uh, but, but others thought that it was taking too much power. It was rather uh, something like Marbury versus Madison in the sense that there was no clear text that gave the court authority, but it was a very reasonable reading of the basic law that said that the Knesset uh, was also limited by this basic law. Um, but there were other developments um, such as the rise of uh, reasonableness, meaning that the government had to do uh, everything in a reasonable fashion um, and other um, developments um, that were, um, again, dissatisfying for various segments of society. Um, and now we are facing uh, what you have termed a very radical, um, I think, or very quick um, try attempt by the government to reform um, the situation. Uh, many of us think that this is not simple reform, um, but that this is a rather extreme um, overhauling of the entire system. Some even call it a regime change. Some use the term almost like a, a um, legal coup in the sense that these are not mere policy changes that are being attempted by the government, but really reforming almost all basic fundamentals um, of what has become our system um, over the past 40 years. Um, I don't know if you want me now um, to state kind of the basic elements of the reform. I could do that um, if you would give me two more minutes. I just don't want to take too much time. Yeah, why don't you frame what the basic elements are so we have an understanding of, of what we're talking about here. Sure, gladly. Um, so I would say there are many elements to the reform. And in a way, what we are mostly concerned about is the agglomeration of them. That is not just one by one, but the entirety, um, the holistic reform. Um, one basic um, um, tenet of the reform, again, or, or the overhauling, is the structure of the committee that elects judges in Israel. Currently, the committee is comprised of nine members, um, three of them Supreme Court justices, two ministers, two members of parliament, and two representatives of the Israeli um, legal bar. Um, this structure doesn't give any authority or any um, um, part of government um, any um, uh, ruling power, um, which has resulted in a very balanced um, um, system of electing judges. Very professional because both the bar and the judges are electing usually judges based on how uh, qualified they are. And because of the balance between um, the judiciary, the parliament, the government, there has been um, a negotiation and therefore the court is extremely balanced. At least we think it is extremely balanced. Many of us think so. Um, the coalition, the government um, is arguing that it is unbalanced and that there is a lot, uh, that there is too much power to the judiciary. And according to their proposition, um, and what is now passed in first uh, calling in the Knesset, there's gonna be a complete control of the coalition over the, um, over the judicial uh, appointment committee, which means that by a simple majority, the coalition will elect all judges. And here I wanna emphasize something which is important. In Israel, the retirement age of judges is 70. So the, um, the um, opportunity for the coalition to appoint now judges that will really transform the structure of the court is at hand. They can be, uh, they can very easily um, now appoint a lot of judges. And what we fear is that those judges will not be professional um, because again, it's gonna be um, uh, controlled only by politician um, or by a majority of the politicians. The second element is uh, taking away the power of the Supreme Court. Um, 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 to quash um, parliamentary legislation, um, not in its entirety, but weakening significantly. Um, currently, um, there needs to be a simple majority by Supreme Court justices um, um, to quash Knesset legislation. According to the proposal, um, the, the, the Supreme Court will have to sit in all its 15 judges, um, and the majority needed to uh, disqualify legislation would be 12 out of the 15. It's extremely, extremely difficult to do that. So practically speaking, um, Supreme Court will probably not be able or will be, um, uh, will almost not um, uh, disqualify any legislation. Again, because there are judges who are right-wing, who are religious, who are um, of, of various um, uh, political uh, inclinations. So it's very, um, I would say, unlikely that they will reach such a majority. Um, the third element um, is that, um, 
the Supreme Court will not be able to review, to, to do a judicial review over the basic laws. Again, basic laws in Israel are supposed to be the fundamental laws, the constitutional laws. Um, and the problem is that any uh, legislation that the parliament wants can be coined basic law. Um, so there's no other test except for if the parliament chooses law. And if we now take away the power of the Supreme Court to disqualify or to uh, quash um, any basic laws, the parliament can just term any legislation that it wants a basic law and thus immunize it from, uh, um, um, from review by the Supreme Court. The other element in the, in the reform um, is weakening the independence, uh, the independence of um, um, legal advisors, both the legal advisor of the government, but also legal advisors in the various ministries, uh, which means again that, um, and also to turn them into political appointments, uh, which means that the, again, ministers will simply be able to ignore what we think is the law or what is stated as the law, both by the uh, legal advisor of the government and the various uh, uh, ministers. Uh, and there are many, many more other elements um, to the judicial um, overhaul. Um, we might be able to talk about them, but these are kind of the most significant ones that are that we're most worried about. And I just want to say maybe last one thing, um, that part of the reform is also to turn the basic laws, human dignity and freedom of occupation, again, which have been the sole um, uh, reservoir um, or kind of a bill of rights in Israel, and to actually strip down um, the, the status, uh, the status of these laws as basic laws, and therefore the court will actually not be able to disqualify legislation based on these basic laws. So we will be stripped off any bill of rights or any significant bill of rights. And we're gonna come back to this topic in a minute. I just wanna do a little bit more framing of the issue. Let's move to Uriel and talk about, give us a little bit of background about who these individuals and groups are that are pushing for the reforms and why are they doing so? Will do. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, and hello, everyone. Uh, first, an apology. Uh, democratic backsliding has been taking a toll on my throat, so occasionally I will resort to some throat candies. And I also prepared a couple of slides that might help me uh, deliver the message. So let me share the screen with you. There it goes. I hope that you can see. Can you, Jennifer? Yes, thank you. Cool. So very briefly, um, first about the key individuals who are leading the effort. Um, two among them are, of course, Netanyahu, Benjamin Netanyahu, the current prime minister, and uh, the um, leader of the Shas party, Arya Deri. Both of them for uh, partly at least personal reason. Um, both of them had been involved in uh, judicial personal matters. Um, Derry was convicted a couple of times. Netanyahu is facing uh, allegations in, in his trial. And both have good personal reasons to do away with certain uh, judicial restrictions. It's more importantly, perhaps, uh, to the ongoing bureaucratic effort to make the judicial overhaul is uh, Simcha Rotman and uh, Yariv Levy. Both of them have been uh, very much ideologically committed to the cause they have devoted years, uh, in both cases actually over a decade of their life working for the goal of uh, um, uh, changing uh, dramatically the way that the judicial uh, system in Israel uh, operates. Uh, their commitment uh, is to such an extent that it is very hard to see how any of them would be willing to make any substantial compromise. Now, of course, it's not just about individual, it's also about organization. One that uh, I thought would be worth mentioning is the Kohelet Policy Forum that is heavily funded by uh, wealthy American uh, Jews and has been uh, pushing forward uh, the agenda that has matured into the uh, proposed reform. There are media outlets that are also favoring the changes. One that is especially noteworthy is Channel 14 that has been uh, in, increasing in popularity in Israel in terms of its uh, viewership. Now, all of these are about, uh, in some ways, uh, the elites. If we turn to the public, here are a couple of uh, interesting, I think, public opinion polls 
that are taken from the very recent uh, um, Israel Democratic uh, uh, Institute index. And there are some interesting oddities, or at least uh, ostensible oddities. One is that there is a growing concern among uh, overall in Israel for the state of its democracy. Uh, the number of Israelis who uh, believe that Israel is in grave danger, Israel's democracy is in grave dangers, has been uh, increasing recently. But at the same time, another thing has been increasing, which is the desire to see Israel's unique problem being addressed by a strong leader. Now, this might seem like a contradiction. Democracy doesn't uh, usually go with a strong leader, but it would make sense if we focus on the main group that is behind both trends, which is right wing. And for many of them, Israel democracy uh, is, a, is now a dysfunctional and so require a replacement of some another system where you have a strong leader, or you do require a strong leader in order to manifest what true democracy is in their mind, that is manifesting the will of the people. Now, an important element that also resonates with the, those public opinion polls is the level of trust in various institutions in Israel, and you can see that uh, in the slide on the left. The Supreme Court overall has been enjoying a relatively high public uh, trust, but it has been declining. If you compare it to other institutes, uh, it is far more trusted than, say, the government, the media, the Knesset, the political parties. Even today, even in 2022, the Supreme Court is more trusted by the Israeli public. But the trust in the Israeli public has been declining. And as you can see in the uh, slide, in the right side of the slide, it has mainly happened in the uh, right wing segments of the Israeli public. And if you look at the chronicles of that, it would be no coincidence, I think, that a substantial decline has uh, matured since Netanyahu rose again to power over a decade ago. That's about it in terms of the main uh, forces, both individual groups and the general public. Thank you. Let's turn to, each, the, to Itai for a minute. Can you talk to us a bit about the financial implications of these reforms being proposed? We're hearing news about companies either pulling out of Israel or, or stopping planning to stop investing in Israel, implications for the tech industry. Give us some sense what these reforms could mean if enacted. Uh, hi all, thank you for, for having me. So just to reiterate what Isha and Uriel said, I think this is very, very trying times for Israel. Those who have been here many years, even at Yom Kippur War, describe this as very challenging time for Israel. Uh, so uh, be, this is definitely something that we feel here every day. In terms of the economics, so I think there's a, a wide consensus, like I, I think never been such a consensus in Israel among economists, and that this reform is going to be very uh, problematic for the Israeli economy. And there's support by right wing economists, those who has, uh, and, and left side, uh, those who have left the views, and there has been support or concern raised by even those who worked under Netanyahu. So it's like, and yesterday there was uh, the former chief economist of Kohelet, the forums that Ariel mentioned before, also came out and speak publicly that he is concerned. So in that sense, there is a wide consensus that this uh, change or, or coup or whatever we call this is going to have dramatic implication for the Israeli economy. And that's uh, one thing that needs to be uh, there is a consensus about it, uh, unfortunately. Uh, why, why do economists are concerned? And then I'm going to get back to what's actually happening in Israel. There is research that shows uh, unequivocally that democracy, democracies are better in terms of economics, in terms of growth, in terms of well-being of, of individuals. Um, and this is the concern is that we are moving away from being a liberal or being a democracy and reducing the ability of the of the judiciary to have power in this in the democracy of Israel, and that's a big concern. What particular is, is the, the concern? So there's various concerns, but one of them, and that relates to Jennifer's question, is talking about property rights or why do investors put money in Israel? And if they are concerned that their property rights, their money, their investments are perhaps not secured, and perhaps somebody in the future 
may not uh, may take them, or maybe the courts are not strong enough or not independent enough to have their strict voice de depend defending the rights of those investors. This is the main concern. And speaking about the tech, which is like the engine of the Israel economy, uh, just to give you some numbers about more of more than 50% of the Israeli exports come from the tech industry. Talking about direct taxes, about a quarter of the direct taxes in Israel come from the tech industry, and about 12% of the workforce work in the tech industry. That's the engine of the Israel economy. However, if we think about money coming to Israel for investments, I think the number is about 90, more than 90% of the money for investment in the tech is coming from abroad. And then we talk and then people talk to investors who are thinking about putting money in Israel and now they see that their money is, is not secured. This is a big, big concern for, for, for them. And we see both international firms that stop or hesitate to put the money now and want to see what's going to happen in Israel before they make investments. And some firms, Israeli firms or firms here are moving money outside of Israel. Just yesterday, there was a firm uh, called Risify that is, I think, traded in the Nasdaq that decided not only to put money, to, to, the, to take money that is now in Israel and put it outside of Israel. They also are planning, have formal plans to take those who work in Israel and move them to Portugal, to take workers that work in the tech industry in Israel and move them to Portugal. And this is just one example of why we are concerned, really concerned that this is just the, the first step of other firms that they are thinking about it, thinking about seriously, that if the firm that think about it, it take time to do actual moves. And this is one firm that actually is making actual move to take their people outside of Israel, move them to Portugal. And remember, those who work in the tech industry are very mobile. So they're not, they're very, they can find the, Quite easily, it's not easy to live where the country where you live, but those people have the skills to move elsewhere. And this is likely to happen more and more. And this is one of the main concerns of what we are thinking, seeing here in Israel these days. Thank you. I, I think one thing we should, uh, Yusha, you sort of, you, you, you mentioned this, but I think we should just devote a little bit more time to kind of comparing and contrasting how Supreme Court judges are appointed in Israel and in the U.S. just to give our audience kind of more of a sense of, of the issue and, and, and kind of how it differs from the situation we have here in the United States. Isha, you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Yeah. Sorry. Um, sure. So um, I think one of the um, one of um, the challenges that are that we're facing is uh, how much politicization um, can um, of the appointment of judges um, is desirable or I would say tolerable. Um, as we know, in the U.S., the um, election of federal judges um, is extremely political in the sense that it's done by the president and approved by the Senate. Um, so one could say, you know, what's bad about this system? Um, so I just want to emphasize, you know, as, as Americans definitely know, that until recently, um, uh, you had filibuster, um, which meant that to appoint at least Supreme Court justices and not that long before that, even to appoint any federal judge, um, it, would, it would have been required to have at least 60 senators, meaning often to have some kind of bipartisanship agreement which would moderate the election of judges. Um, so I would say, first of all, why not take a system that incorporates um, not just politicization, but also including the opposition? And I think we can see from the US that the minute that the filibuster uh, was actually um, um, discarded, um, it hasn't produced better judges. Um, there are some scholarly studies that actually demonstrate um, that the more political a purely political and also purely majoritarian um, the election of judges is, the less professional and also the more extreme they are. Um, and again, in our current system, it's not the judges elect judges. Judges are part of the system. There are only three out of nine. So obviously they have a voice. 
um, they're being heard, but it's not that they control the system. So I think that even if we go um, and uh, through some form of more political influence on the election of judges, um, we have to, uh, to draw a, a red line um, 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 of a control of a complete control of the coalition. We have to have the position there and we have to have some kind of a more expertise based election of judges. Um, so I would say that this is a, a real challenge, even if we go down the road of some reform, not going all the way down to just pure simple majority of the coalition, which means that it will you know, or at least the fear is that it will be more corrupt. It will be really based on political affiliation um, and there will be less professional judges and again, more extreme kind of coalition judges. Thank you. It, 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 there's a certainly a, a some percentage of the population in Israel that feels that the Supreme Court has really enjoyed sort of, you know, sort of full authority and has been very uh, activist, certainly in recent years, um, over the government. And perhaps that sort of has led us down this path. It, you know, is this accurate? Is there, you know, is there a reason to start some sort of reforms? So, you know, I think that mistakes have been made. Um, I think that um, the Supreme Court, uh, first of all, has not been representative enough for many decades in the sense that it was um, very male, it was very Ashkenazi, um, it was very elite. Um, but during the past 20 years, it has significantly changed. Um, you know, for example, 20% of Supreme Court justices are religious um, um, national um, um, judges. 20% uh, is actually more than their share of the population. Still, um, there aren't enough Arab um, judges um, women represent only 40%. There aren't enough Mizrahi judges, um, but the reform doesn't address that. So again, part of my critique and critique of my colleagues uh, is, okay, you're right. Things need to be reformed in the structure or in the, compos in the uh, composition of the Supreme Court, but the reform does very little to do that. And again, just gives the coalition power over it. What else um, um, the Supreme Court perhaps I think stepped into, um, um, I would say, not uh, without sensitivity into the political realm, for example, in the appointment of, of ministers. Um, so about uh, 20 years ago, actually during the Rabin government, the Supreme Court disqualified for the first time Arya Derry from being a minister in the government because, um, because he was uh, prosecuted, um, again, it was in 95. Um, and I thought that this was the wrong decision. That is that if the minister and the government actually wants to elect a minister, even if there is, and I'm saying something that many of my colleagues actually disagree with, um, I think that even if there was a, a prosecution against this minister, as long um, you know, as the court uh, hasn't ruled out that this person uh, hasn't uh, ruled that this person is convicted, I think, that it's a valid political decision to actually allow him to become minister. So I think this was, for example, one mistake by the Supreme Court that really provoked a lot of anger um, in, in the political realm. So I think that this would be a reform that is acceptable. But again, the reform goes so far beyond that. Um, and if we just um, um, think about, um, you know, the thing that really upsets a lot of the politicians or um, or that kind of motivates a lot of the overhaul that we currently see um, is the, again, striking down legislation that is simply in explicit contradiction to what we have as a very kind of narrow bill of rights. And over the past 20 something years, the court has taken this prerogative uh, to strike down laws that go against um, basic laws. It has done so only 20 times. So if you compare it to the US Supreme Court that you know in every session strikes down many, many legislation, uh, both by Congress as well as by the states, our Supreme Court is rather, I would say, moderate in how it behaves. Um, and now the coalition, again, the reform, wants to take even this power um, outside of, of, uh, of the authority of the Supreme Court. So again, I think that some reform needs to be done, but it's not this reform. Thank you. So Israel is a country that is democratic, yet does not have a constitution or a bill of rights. 
and doesn't appear to have real system of checks and balances. Let's let's get into this a little bit. Riel, can you explain the difference in the previous government's approach to judicial reform versus that of the current government? Yeah, gladly. And I will again turn to slideshow that I prefer. And I thought of, of the focusing for a moment on uh, Gidon Sal because I think he's emblematic of the change. Now, Gidon Sal was a member of the Likud party, a very right-wing um, politician, one of the leaders of that party. Um, the reason that he decided to leave it was mainly because of certain strife between him and Netanyahu. He has not changed his ideology. And his ideology goes beyond right wing in terms of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, also in terms of his approach to um, the judicial system in Israel. So he has been advocating for years a um, series of changes. And as you can see in the slide, a couple of those changes he's actually enacted during his term, both as a member of the Likud and later on when he became uh, a justice minister. Still, Saar is one of those who have been uh, very much concerned with what uh, the current government is doing. And I put forward one citation from his words uh, trying to capture that. And I think it is important to note um, something that Ishai mentioned as well. What the current government is trying to do uh, is referred to as reform, but is considered by most experts as a revolution. The key question that I believe all of us should be asking ourselves regarding the, um, the plan, the governmental plan, was in the event that this plan is approved, as is, as it is proposed by the government, is there anything that the coalition will not be able to do? Is there anything that the coalition will not be able to do? And the answer is no. There is nothing that the coalition will not be able to do. The reply of the government is, well, trust us, it will be fine. We're not going to jeopardize democracy or even certain liberal rights. And then the question becomes whether it is indeed a, a trustworthy move, whether the public overall can trust the government without any checks and balances to sustain Israel as democracy, let alone a liberal democracy. And I think the main change that we've seen in the current government is that the government is willing to go all the way uh, forth in order to have, at least in theory, the potential of complete power. How that power will be used, that's a question, of course, of debate. But empirically, just analyzing the way the plan is, and those who support the plan can, uh, can easily grasp that because that is the plan. There will be no institutional check and balance over the uh, power of the coalition. And some of them will say Israeli political culture is sufficiently vibrant in order to sustain democracy. And maybe this is something that we can later approach. The question of political culture, I think is important here. But institutionally, the only check and balance that we've had, the Supreme Court, will effectively be gone. What uh, might be the implications of that, how that can be used or abused, is of course an open question. And that has been the real transformation from previous governments to the current one. So essentially, you're talking about a concentration of power basically in one in one branch and the inability of the legislative branch or of the Supreme Court to overturn uh, legislation made by the ministers of the Knesset. The Both legislative parts. branch doesn't matter that much. That, that is very important to note um, because be in Israel, between the executive and the legislative branches, there is no distinction. The coalition basically rules everything. And the government has the final say, and within the government, it is the prime minister. And because we have no constitution, and we have no constitution, we have 
no uh, two uh, legislative uh, uh, bodies that we elect to. There is no supranational body that Israeli citizens can turn to, such as the European Union, etc. There is no federal organization. There is virtually nothing. There is nothing in Israel as a check and balance, institutional, again, that's important, an institutional check and balance, except the Supreme Court. If that is effectively gone, then really it's a question of whether you trust the people, whether you trust the government, or just sustaining somehow, sustaining democracy, despite the temptation that is always there. Perhaps we, this is now talking a bit about human nature and perhaps the politician nature. Um, whether we want to simply trust people that somehow it will be sustained, or do we need institutional arrangement? Israel will be the only democracy uh, where there is no institutional restraint. If it will be a democracy, mm -hmm. and Itai, can you talk to us sort of from a business? Just, uh, just, I'll add to Uriel's point before addressing your question. So I, I totally agree with Uriel. I just want to add that we can learn from the lessons from Hungary and Poland, other countries that went through similar processes, and they have constitutions. So they were in better shape. They both have constitution, and they both have the European Union as something that governs what they can uh, actually do. And nevertheless, uh, what can we learn from what they what happened there? So, I'll give you two examples from things that happened in Hungary, for instance. Um, they changed the rules of the how how uh, elections are are, are are done in a sense in a way that helps the running coalition to keep power. Okay, so even if there are fewer votes for the government, the coalition by changing the rules of the game. They can maintain their power, they, they can keep in power. This is one example of something that we are concerned. They don't have the checks and balances that potentially can happen, and that happened in Hungary. Another thing that happened in Hungary is going back to my previous point about property rights. So people save for retirement, they save their pensions. In Hungary, the, the government intervened in the pensions and took part of the Hungarian pensions. To, to fund the, whatever they wanted as a coalition. This happened in Hungary, perhaps will happen in Israel, perhaps not, but if this judicial reform would go through, there would be no limit or no way to constrain or pre prevent the government from doing so, other than their uh, goodwill or whatever. And this is another example of the potential big implication on the economy. Perhaps it won't happen tomorrow or next year, but this is a big temptation for anyone who wants to fund uh, whatever the government wants to fund. And that could be the left or the right, but without this limit or without the check and balances, that might happen. If, if I could just add something um, to, the, um, to how much the government is now um, wishing to uh, weaken the judiciary, the same committee that I was describing before will also be able to fire um, um, presiding judges. So in, in the same way that they appoint them, we now fear that the politicization will run so deep that they will also use their power to fire judges, um, to lower the age of retirement, to lower the salaries. All these are indicators that are known globally to mark judicial independence, salary, retirement, um, 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 firing. All of these are gonna be run by the coalition and this is how much power they want over the judiciary. And again, as you said, it's just going to be infinite power at the hands of the coalition. And they actually say, trust us. Now, why should we trust them? We know that politics is not about trusting your politicians. It's about safeguarding. It's about having the right structures that would safeguard the rights, be it in a federal system, in a bicameral system, in anti-majoritarian structures, et cetera, et cetera, as Riel and Itai have mentioned. We don't have all these. Right, so it's really about concentrating power in the in the hands of the coalition and stripping the power away from the uh, away from the Supreme Court and the judicial. There's one, you know, uh, sort of idea that's been bandied around, and that's whether President Herzog's going to be able to step in and work on a compromise. Do, you know, to the three of you, do you have any any word on that? Any feelings on his ability to make some kind of headway? So I think we we don't know, of course, the de all the details. I, I, I speak for myself, but there is a. We are very concerned about a compromise which would 
there is no half democracy. So if you want democracy, there should be clear guidelines what democracy is and what checks and balances are. And having some sort of compromise, of, you know, they wanted to have uh, the, 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 the reform ask for having 12 uh, um, uh, judges to override a decision by the Knesset, and now it's going to be a 10. This is, it's, it's not kind of a compromise that I think we can, we, I'm talking about myself, can live with. I think something changing, something more essential, something more basic that would allow the Israeli democracy to go on forward uh, without being concerned, okay, we got to a compromise now, okay, and perhaps next year they will try again, uh, run something like that. So I think having a compromise, is, it's, it's, it's kind of a, a, of course, we want to, to come up with an agreement that both sides can live with, but not any compromise is a good compromise. And many just compromises could be a very bad thing for the Israeli democracy. And this is something that we need to, to, to remind ourselves. So, so I actually think that, um, that one of the things that might be, uh, you know, maybe a silver lining or a room for optimism around, around the negotiations in Herzog is actually not to view it as a compromise, but as a constitutional moment that we as Israelis um, need to actually grasp. That is to understand that we have come to a moment where things don't work anymore. Obviously, they don't work also for a lot of right-wingers, and we need to also address what's upsetting them, what's bothering them, but to also realize that things don't work for the liberal part, let's say. Um, as we know, in Israel, there's no separation of church and state, and a lot of the quarrel is actually around that. As you know, rabbinical courts uh, control marriage and divorce, they control personal status, um, you know, the Shabbat um, is not just about, you know, a cultural thing. There is actually our laws that, um, that um, control this. Um, and, and both parties need to be, um, I would say, to have a new social contract. Um, and this is a moment, I think, um, that we need to, um, to grasp. But this really requires to stop what's going on now, to sit down quietly, to have all parties engaged. That is groups from the right, from the left, from the center, from the Palestinian community, from the settlers community, from all the relevant communities, and to think anew about the constitutional structure of Israel, to have a real Bill of Rights, to have a parliament that's limited. You know, for Americans, it's clear that your parliament has limited powers. As, as you know, as Uriel and Itai mentioned, our Knesset is unlimited. It can do whatever it wants. This is not uh, a sustainable um, political structure. We know of no democracy almost that works like this. You know, even in the UK, it's very different. They have a very different also political culture. And also they used to have at least um, 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 the, e the EU. Um, but again, you know, in, in the intense conflicts that we have, we need to sit to form a new constitution that will be acceptable to everyone. You don't do it in such haste. You don't do it in such narrow majority. You know, 64 is not that big of a majority, especially if you think about, you know, the numbers um, um, that actually voted for the coalition. This really needs to be handled differently. Um, I hope that the president understands that, but I'm not sure because the president really tries, first of all, to stop what's going on now. And it's very hard to convince the coalition that this is what we need to do now. So one of the things we've been talking about, the term basic laws, and I, I think we should take a minute to step back and throw it to any one of the three of you. Can you talk to us a little bit about, since you know the, in the US we do have a constitution and this concept of basic laws is foreign, could, could you just give us a sense of kind of like what you mean by basic laws? Um, well, so this might be a little bit of a, of a tiring historical, uh, um, uh, you know, um, conversation. So I'll be very brief. Um, you know, it, when Israel was established in 48, um, according to um, you know actually the Declaration of Independence and also the um, uh, the mandate by the by the UN, uh, we are so, supposed to form um, a constitution for various reasons, including actually the refusal by Ben Gurion. A constitution was not um, legislated. However, it was decided that the Knesset will have the constitutive power 
to legislate basic laws that are more fundamental dealing with either rights or with the structure of government, which is what the constitution needs usually to do. And by enacting these, a line of basic laws, we will eventually have a constitution, but this never really happened. So what we have is an ongoing endeavor of every now and then um, legislating the Knesset would wear its constitutive hat and legislate a basic law. Some of them are constitutionally in their nature, you know, dealing with the powers of the Knesset, with the powers of the government, et cetera, et cetera. And as I said, only in 92, we also had the addition of basic laws that are in a way um, like Bill of Rights-like, that is dealing with basic rights. However, it has never materialized into one constitution. It means that basic laws can be amended, changed almost any way the Knesset wants. As I said, the Knesset can term any law a basic law, even if it's not constitutive in its nature. So there's a big mess and we are really lacking a constitution that will somehow stabilize a structure which as we see is extremely unstable and it doesn't work for anyone's benefit. So question to either Itai or Uriel, T talk to us about sort of why, why is this happening now? Why, why has you know, Netanyahu's, why has he not enacted something like this earlier? Why is this coming up right at this, at this time? Where do you want? Go for it. Um, I think that they provided some of the reasoning. Uh, unfortunately, there are elements that are personal. I'm saying unfortunately, but that's the way people are, right? Uh, to a certain extent, it is personal on the part of Netanyahu because of the trial that uh, he's now undergoing and Derry too, who wants to become again the Minister of uh, Interior Affairs, et cetera. And also the coalescence of uh, certain demographic political trends in Israeli public and ideological and economic trends, right? The various uh, trends are coming together, coalescing now into this uh, proposal. And there is also a sense um, you know, maybe I'll provide you with this uh, slide that I also prepared. I think that it may, it may capture some elements of it. Um, let me show you. So, so this is Zothman. And this is from his recent uh, interview in Haaretz. And I think those words are remarkable. I mean, part of what I do, this is why I'm turning to that, is analyzing public discourse. And I, and I find it fascinating. So Rothman is uh, resorting now to the famous case of uh, Solomon's judgment. And in the interview, he's saying as follows, I am King Solomon. I should explain that you must not leave the infant in the hands of those who are willing to burn the country because they lost the election. Okay, so in his mind, the infant is the country. The infant is Israel. And those who opposed his reform are basically willing to burn the country. Them, thereby proving they are not the real mother. They demonstrate, he's saying, that they are unworthy to hold it, the infant, Israel. Our job is to tell these people, guys, you're not the real mother. Now, in some ways, in political science, that would be a sort of the textbook of, uh, of populism, which can be summed up in the phrase, we are the people, you're not. We are the representative of the real people. You're not. And the numbers do not really matter. As Ishai previously indicated, if you look at the actual numbers of the recent election, um, the current coalition gained less than 50% of the actual votes. But there is a certain threshold the two uh, parties in the uh, supposed uh, opposition didn't manage to cross, thereby the result that we see with 64 seats for the coalition. And I think that Rothman perspective is not entirely at odds, not just with politicians from the coalition, but uh, uh, some key groups uh, in Israeli public who strongly have a sense that they have been taken over by sort of a dictatorship in which the Supreme Court is an important part. And they've been taking over their life. They've been taking over the will of the people that they identified with their own. And this is time to rectify. And, you know, I briefly note that uh, 
their argument is not entirely without merit. It is partly because of what uh, Yishai uh, and Itai mentioned before, the many troubles that we have in Israeli democracy, that the Supreme Court has become uh, the default option for many people, from the center and the left, the, the liberal camp, so to speak, in Israel. This is absolutely true. And I do hope that what uh, Yishai outlined before might be a vision for the future, that this will be a sort of a crisis where an opportunity will be given for a constitutional moment in which uh, the judicial uh, system, and especially the Supreme Court, will not have to come again and again to save the day, to save uh, uh, human rights, and beyond even right and left, human rights, because by and large, maybe I should close with that, the Supreme Court has been ruling uh, relentlessly in favor of uh, the security consideration of Israel. It wasn't really a question of uh, left and right throughout the years. Again and again, for example, the judicial uh, system uh, approved uh, is the, the conduct of Israeli settlement, the conduct of Israeli government with the ongoing occupation of the West Bank. And that uh, should be taken into consideration. Um, Jennifer, let me just add that for Netanyahu, there are very several statements that Netanyahu has made 10 years ago, expressively saying that he is in favor of a strong judiciary. He's saying that there is no one dictatorship where there is a strong judiciary, uh, independent judiciary. And there's a very clear difference in the, uh, the, between Netanyahu 10 years ago and Netanyahu today. Uh, that goes, of course, with Rotman and, and uh, Levin who are like ideologically thinking that this should be changed. But in Netanyahu, we clearly see the change from Netanyahu 10 years ago, who surely, stop any such initiatives and Netanyahu today, who is uh, of course helping this to happen, uh, unfortunately. Um, one other thing in terms of what related to what's happening in Israel and what can we learn, going back to the lessons from Hungary and Poland, these countries, there's a textbook and you look at their experience and they look first at the judiciary and they go over the judiciary and the next step is going over the media and controlling the media in a way to help uh, the public know about what the government want them, the, want them to know. Uh, and there's kind of a textbook where also the elite is kind, kind of discredited in these countries. And we feel it also to some extent today in Israel, wherever the elite is kind of not, uh, is professionalism is not that important as not being also in academia is kind of dangerous. It's not dangerous in the sense that it's, uh, there is no credit for being a professional or somebody who has learned or a scholar. These things that happen in those countries likely to happen also uh, in Israel. Yeah, we've seen, you know, you, that's an interesting trend. We've seen it here in the US with the rise of the Tea Party and sort of these populist, you know, fringe le left and right kind of less center, more more tracking left and right parties. Is there, you know, you all sort of talked about the constitution and, and, and constitutional you know, convention. Is there any real, true appetite for something like this in Israel? For a what, excuse me? Some sort of constitutional convention or con discussion about, about really forming a constitution. I think that, you know, um, in the early 90s, um, there was a moment where there was a real call for constitution. Um, but one of the problems was that, especially for the religious parties, um, at that time at least, um, what's really at stake, and, you know, um, it's it, we can't ignore that, is the value of equality. So what is really very basic for Americans, for example, you know, that equal protection, et cetera, is a fundamental value. A lot of what's going on now is actually the refusal to accept equality as a constitutional value. Um, that's, a real, uh, that's a real obstacle. Um, and I think for many other groups, however, there is, there is an appetite for a constitutional moment, uh, for, a, for a constitutional convention. I'm not sure if we'll get there. I'm, I'm trying to be really optimistic about that. Um, but again, you know, um, just thinking about looking at the coalition agreement. So, you know, when, when in Israel, a coalition is formed, there are agreements between the various parties um, um, around what is their, what are their demands. Um, 
So obviously these agreements cannot be enforced because these are political agreements, but they demonstrate the direction. And what we fear is that, the, again, the judicial reform or overhaul or uh, revolution, how whatever we call it, um, is actually a way of achieving some of these um, coalition agreements. And they are disturbing in many ways. They're disturbing because they, at least some of them risk to, um, to legislate discrimination, a lot of religious exemptions um, against equality, um, even having a basic law that would protect the privilege of, of ultra-Orthodox not to serve in the, in the military um, and not to serve even some kind of a civil service, um, enlarging um, separation between men and women in the public sphere, um, and many other legislation. Again, I think Itai might also mention um, problematic vis-a-vis -vis the protection of property um, that would disturb again, because again, the only protection that we have for property in Israel is the basic law, human dignity, uh, which also mentions property, and the coalition seems to be determined again to uh, deprive this basic law of its constitutive uh, status. Um, so pro property will be protected less, both of Palestinians, by the way, uh, but also of Israelis. Um, so all these things kind of depict a rather glim picture, um, but again, maybe a hope for a constitutional convention or a moment um, that I think everyone will benefit from. We have unfortunately a few minutes. We'd, I, we, I'd love to end on some sort of uplifting or some sort of message you can bring us. Talk to, from each of your perspectives, sort of what's, you know, what's the positive way out? How, what, what's sort of the, the positive op, option, potential path forward from where we are here? So we are fighting hard to keep Israel as a, as a liberal democracy to some extent. And hopefully what Ishai said about having a moment of of potential uh, constitution moment, that is our hope that that would actually uh, come become something realistic. Uh, show you just a, a t-shirt that we prepared, uh, perhaps you see it. It's for all students who come next week for the semester. So the semester starts next week and we are Hold actually- Hold it up a little bit higher, it's hard to see it, them. It, it says, uh, no, de without democracies, there's no academia. So we're gonna give this to all students coming next week to the campus because we really want the student to be more involved of what's going on in Israel in general. So far it was like uh, 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 midterms and, and, uh, and exams. So they were not so much in, on campus. We want them to have, be involved. Next week we have a democracy week. So it's not like about the protest. It's mostly giving them information what we are trying to get them more involved in what's going on in Israel. And this is going to take place in, in the university, which is a public university. So all things would be some sort, it's, it's some, some sort sensitive, but think about being optimistic. We're hoping, as Ishai said, that's gonna be some constitutional moment where we can actually use this big threat, big danger as some, as some sort of an opportunity to do good changes for Israel. Um, and, and something optimistic. So I grew up um, Orthodox, actually, um, and I have a cousin who is an Orthodox rabbi. Um, and about two weeks ago, um, we signed a petition, a call for reconciliation, uh, 15 professors from the liberal left, um, and 15 rabbis, Orthodox rabbis, not reform, not conservative. Um, and we have signed a call for a truce, for a reconciliation. Um, this was a really rare moment in which you have rabbis from the right, agreeing with professors from the liberal left, um, calling for a negotiation. Um, we hope to be called by the president. You know, we have, um, we have and, and we think that, you know, such kind of more optimistic paths of, of talking to one another um, do come also from this opportunity, from this great crisis. Thank you. And Uriel? I think I, I share that sentiment. Uh, I share that uh, yearning. Also, in terms of you know my own family, I um, a couple of weeks ago I was uh, going to one of the demonstrations, and and my mother told me she was very upset about that, and she told me that I, I have no idea why you go to those places. They are so hateful. And and I asked my mother, you know me personally. Do you think that I hate, do you know that I hate any person? 
And she thought for a second and said, no, actually no. And I think that um, perhaps in line with what uh, both Itai and Ishai uh, said, when you look at the Israeli, the Israelis themselves, leave aside the politicians, I think that there is an enormous willingness to at least try and engage, try to open both our minds and our hearts to one another. There is much common ground that we can uh, create together. The current political crisis, the current political predicament, I think prevents us from fully seeing that opportunity and fully seizing that opportunity. And I think there are elements in the current movement that is opening the gate for the possibilities. There are many activities like the one that, that, that Ishai mentioned before that I hope will, will mature, will develop, that will create the um, true bridges rather than bubbles. Look, I've been in the States for uh, enough years to realize that Israel is not unique. Israel is not unique in terms of the depolarization that we've witnessed in our society. And maybe it is a wishful thinking, but I would like to see Israel, even in terms of light onto the nation, as paving a path for societies engulfed in such polarization, showing that there is another way, that there is a way to approach one another and, and create a, a better joint future out of this sort of crisis. I do believe that Israeli society has that sort of vitality, has that sort of uh, hope. And if we give it all we can, I believe we can. Thank you, I appreciate each of the three of you. I know these are uh, they're difficult times and I appreciate you giving us some idea of the hope and, and positivity that could come out of, the, of this. Um, Itai, Uriel, and Ishai, thank you for being so generous with your time and helping us to understand the current situation and put it in the proper context. It's clear that change is needed. We need democracy for sure. Um, but in a way that preserves Israel's democracy and protects the right of minorities and property and all these basic rights that, that we as Americans take for granted. Uh, thank you to our friends from around the world for your support at Tel Aviv University and for joining us today. Uh, for any of you who wish to view this again or anyone who's missed it, a copy of today's webinar can be found in our webinar library uh, on our website, which is www aftau.org. Uh, thanks so much and have a great rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you.